has he ever talked about K2? And how does K2 make him feel? Forget the use of force. That was barely even mentioned in this report, but you have to read between the lines. As you know, that's why I have to decode this stuff. So once he indicates, yeah, he might have smoked some K2 in the past, boom, they got him. So now it's K2, 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 K2. We're testing. Now we're going to search his room for K2 and this and that. So that opened up the door that just that he, he might have hit the hit the, the K2 just a little bit. That's going to excuse whatever they did. Welcome to the Criminal Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Moliere Dimash, and uh, we're going to go over another mysterious death within the prison system. Um, while we uh, go over this specific case, um, I want to have a discussion about uh, synthetic cannabinoids. They call it K2. We must have a discussion about the K2 epidemic, folks. Um, I've been looking over all of these reports, right? And I see that a lot of the summaries are being uh, attributed to synthetic cannabinoids. Like, they're, 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 inmates are dying by ways of use of force, right? And they're, um, bending over backwards to blame it on the K2 epidemic. While, you know, the K2 issue is real. You know, the, the consumption of it, the effects of it, it's all real. But what I'm noticing is that um, the uh, the deaths are being attributed to that. If there's any kind of evidence that points the, the Department of Corrections in the direction of the K2, it's over. Your, your, your murder's gonna get covered up and they're gonna blame it on the K2. And that seems to be the case with uh, this inmate today. Um, uh, Jose Villegas. And it's so crazy, man, because uh, I know him. And I was at Taylor with him uh, in 2014. and I actually worked together to stop a war, a gang war. Well, not a gang war, because uh, the parties involved were, uh, it was the folk nation going at it with the Haitian inmates, the Zos. And um, me being Haitian, I was always with the Haitian inmates, but I'm not gang affiliated, you know. But uh, he and I were good friends, and, uh, you know, we were, you know, two well-respected inmates who could talk to everybody else in between to stop it because uh, there was an incident between uh, a Haitian and a folk, a G, and it got serious because, you know, the G's had love for that inmate that was involved, and we wasn't going to let nothing happen to a Haitian on the compound, period. Whether it, regardless of what he did, it wasn't going down like that. But, uh, you know, me, they used to call him Tyson because he looked like Mike Tyson a little bit. And uh, me and Tyson uh, came together and said, you know, it's, it's not going down. We, we all not going to get involved in any violence. So he was not a violent person because he was a big dude. He, he could have been a bully. He could have been somebody going around doing this and doing that. And uh, he was high ranking in the folk nation. And he could have he, he could have been that bad guy. But, you know, I did time with him for a good little minute at Taylor, I never seen a, a violent bone in his body. He was he was one of those guys, you know, you can get it misconstrued about him. You can look at him and be like, oh man, yeah, I don't want to get messed up with this guy. But he was cool, smooth sailing. But um, apparently he ended up at Lake CI. And uh, 
He passed out in the cell. Now, according to his roommate, where this guy wasn't his roommate. This was somebody inside of his cell. Uh, inmate uh, John Clay. John Clay says that, you know, he was in the room hanging out with Tyson. And, um, you know, he saw Tyson smoke what he believed to be a cigarette. And then he seen him pass out on the ground. So I guess he called for help. You know, like, oh, you know, we got a man down. We need some medical assistance in here to get my friend up off of the ground. It's, this is just like, you know, when you call the police to resolve an issue in black neighborhoods. They're gonna come, but they're gonna hurt somebody. So um, the officers came in there and they told the other inmate to step out of the cell. So he steps out and all of a sudden, all he hears is stop resisting, stop resisting. We know how that goes in the free world. So just imagine how that goes in prison. You, you can call the police to come over here and help this man who you think is in need of resuscitation. All of a sudden you hear stop resistance, he's passed out. So apparently they beat this man for like 30 minutes. And um, the inspectors did an interview with John Clay and he told them, you know, I heard the police saying stop resisting, stop resisting, but he was not resisting. He, he told them that. So guess what they do? They start interviewing him about K2. Now that's the thing about these reports that I've been reading. If it's an officer involved murder where the evidence like points almost exclusively to the staff member, the reports are short and concise. But when there's any evidence that it was an inmate on inmate homicide or a, a, a result of the K2, they're gonna write a book. They're gonna write a whole book lay out all of the evidence, but they're gonna minimize it. They're almost gonna practically not write anything if it's strictly on the officer. So they start, they give him a lengthy interview about K2 and has he ever seen him smoke it in the past? And has he ever talked about K2? And how does K2 make him feel? Forget the use of force. That was barely even mentioned in this report, but you have to read between the lines. Because, you know, that's why I have to decode this stuff. So once he indicates, yeah, he might have smoked some K2 in the past, boom, they got him. So now it's K2, 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 K2. We're testing, now we're gonna search his room for K2 and this and that. So that opened up the door that just that he, he might have hit, the, hit the, the K2 just a little bit. That's gonna excuse whatever they did to him. So apparently, and, and I noticed also in this report, all of the witnesses who uh, supported the claim that K2 had been smoked. Their names are out there in the report. But anybody who said anything to the contrary, their names were redacted. And apparently, one of the redacted names is a nurse. And the nurse, in her recorded interview with the inspector, she initially says that uh, she was confused when she got to the dorm. Because when she got to the dorm, she witnessed the officers struggling with Tyson. Apparently that, that's when they were beating him up. And she's like, well, I was confused because I thought we were there to provide medical attention. So peep this, this unidentified nurse, she says that um, she heard yelling and banging in the cell, right? Can you believe they made her leave? They made her leave. So she's on call to come and, and she was about to go home. They called her to the to uh, E dormitory to help assist with Tyson, and um, she gets there thinking, okay, I gotta help save someone's life, like not save life like I told you how to do a Swanee, but literally, you know, help this man. And they're beating him up when she gets in there, so she's confused. So they make her leave, like, nah, nurse, you ain't coming to help nobody. You get outside of the dorm. So she's outside waiting. And um, it was crazy because uh, when when he get when they pull him out of the dorm, she says, "Oh, they just put a spit shield on his head." She didn't observe him spitting or biting or none of that. She says that you know after after they had already pulled him out of the cell, they put the spit shield on his head. The spit shield is like a cone that covers your whole face. Now in the Florida prison system. You guys got to read that uh, It Takes a Criminal to Know One if you haven't got it already. I 
tell you all of these methods that they use. The spit shield, that's what they use to cover your face if they done messed you up. If they done knocked your teeth out, or if you're bleeding, or they done ripped your eyeball out, they're gonna put that spit shield over your head so when they're wheeling you out, nobody can see what they did to you. So it's funny because she goes on to say in her report that she observed something on him that happened recently after they had already restrained him because she saw him multiple times. She saw them as they were beating him up. She saw them as he was already taken down. She saw him as he put the spit shirt on, but then she says, I saw a blank. They redacted that part out. That must have happened recently. So she either saw blood, she saw lacerations, or she saw residue from those chemical agents that happened after this man was already in handcuffs. That's corporal punishment. Nobody's indicted. So um, they end up interviewing this lieutenant, Milton Gass, and this is where this crap gets unbelievable. Milton Gass, they initially restrained Tyson, right? And for some reason, they put the handcuffs on the front of him and they drag him out of the room. And the other inmates were saying as they drug him out, he wasn't moving, right? So this is a new method and I didn't know about this. And, you know, because in anatomy, I, I tell you so many different styles of abuse, you know, it's categorized, it's that much abuse. But this is a new one to me. Lieutenant Gass, they, they have this man handcuffed in the front, right? And they say that he's just restraining and we can't control him. And he's a wild man. They already got the handcuffs on, right? So Lieutenant Gass orders them to take the handcuffs off because they're in the front. We need to put his handcuffs in the back. They took the handcuffs off and that was an excuse to beat him some more and say that he was resisting while they were trying to restrain him. You see? Take the handcuffs off of him. He's already restrained. He can't hurt us. But take the handcuffs off and put it behind him so that we can say that he was resisting arrest again. You had to arrest him twice while he was passed out. He, he, he wasn't moving when y'all pulled him out of, the, out of the cell. You see what I'm saying? So um, that was another excuse. But it gets even stranger than that because he finds an excuse. Uh, some way he removed himself from the situation, I guess, when they actually killed him at the, the moment of uh, death because ironically he says he was relieved by Major Sean Lee now my rank and file folks any of y'all been in the military any of y'all been in any type of service since when does the higher ranking officer relieve you imagine you go to uh when Dixie, right? And the bag boy has to be relieved. Is he gonna be relieved by the, 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 the general manager? Is the general manager gonna come out there and start pushing them carts? So he's relieved by a high ranking officer because he had something else to do in the middle of an inmate death. Really? So he's relieved and apparently he had to go uh, hang up some broom handles or something. They don't even say what he had to go do, but he leaves and his excuse is, oh, I, had, I reviewed the tapes later. Yeah, right. So he gets relieved by a major and uh, they come with the camera and, and it gets even more strange because this officer, uh, Melissa Van Curen, she, um, she is the camera operator, right? And I noticed in the report as they're transporting him to confinement, they turn the camera off at the confinement door. Now, during the use of force, you're supposed to show everything. You're supposed to film it until, if you sprayed him, until he's placed in a decontamination shower or until you secure him in his confinement cell. Then you conclude the footage. They turn the camera off in, in, in front of the dorm, according to what I read. So they turn the camera off. Then all of a sudden, He's dead in the confinement unit. Now, it, it, these redactions make it hard to see exactly what happened, but from what I read, they take him into the dorm and the nurse comes, the same nurse that they redacted, and she's checking for a pulse, right? She can't detect nothing. So there's efforts to resuscitate him. And this report says that whoever was trying to resuscitate him got tired and said, I'm going home. And 
left the man to die until somebody else came to resuscitate him again after he's long gone. So, um, and then they do all this while the man's on the floor. Now, in the confinement units, they have triages. They have medical rooms specifically for confinement inmates. What was the point in throwing him on the ground? He was intended to die here. That's, they cut the camera off, put him on the ground, walked away from him while he was in desperate need of medical attention. And he died. So, uh, the inspector, instead of looking at all of this stuff, they look at um, how much K2 did he smoke? When did he smoke K2? Did he smoke K2 in the last five years? And blah, blah, blah. They're, gonna, they're interviewing other inmates to see just how much of a K2 smoker he was to justify this. And the coroner's going to say, oh, well, there was K2 in his system. That's how it goes. So, um, it's breathtaking how obvious this is and these inspectors it is so it's frightening to know that they're all in cahoots like this organized murder stretches from the inspectors to the coroner's office think about that from the inspectors to the coroner everybody's a part of this group it's almost like they're like they're sacrificing these inmates like they're getting something out of this they're getting something yeah you know i mean who just, you know what I mean, just murders just to murder folks, you know what I mean, like, I've never, like, being, since I've been in society, um, that it's just not, you get aloof to this stuff that goes on in, in, in prison, because you don't see that kind of stuff, you don't see people just murdering just to murder in society, unless it's like, you know, those mass shootings and all of that stuff, but it's not as frequent as it is in the prison system. It, 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 it's just not as it, it, you don't see it as much like well nowadays really you do kind of see two school shootings a week nowadays so I guess uh, it, it's it, prison is just an accurate reflection of society but um, there's another one man um, Jose Belegas folks another one covered up swept under the rug a lot of y'all, I know, uh, you know, you keep in touch with your loved ones in there. And uh, I know you, you, you've you already heard how crazy the, the K2 epidemic is. It truly is uh, uncontrollable. Try to convince them to stay away from that. Not because, you know, uh, even if it's not about getting them off of drugs, the epidemic is being used against the inmates to justify the murders now. I'm sorry about that. My battery keep dying. It's like, you know, my, my gas tank always on E because I'm using this phone for so much stuff. But uh, anyway, um, if you have loved ones that, 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 that you know are involved with that K2 crap, tell them to cut it out because uh, that increases the likelihood that if in the event that something bad happened to them, it's going to be excused away because there's a drug epidemic. It's, it's being uh, misappropriated. And uh, that's how they're maneuvering around everything. You know, we, we made them put audio surveillance in the prisons. You know, we, 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 we trying to get them to where these body cameras and, you know, we trying to it, compel all of this oversight. But they're, 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 they're crafty. They're going to, these are good killers. They're going to find a way to get around whatever we're trying to do. So uh, that's, be very cautious of that because if something happens to your loved one and they try to chalk it up to K2, dig further because there's more to the story this had this whole report doesn't even specify the uh the whole use of force that happened here and the nurse actually was questioned as to whether or not she smelled chemical agents if that was a necessary question there was some foul play please believe it um Oh yeah, uh, I'm in my Dirks Bentley shirt today. Uh, that's why we had the, the different intro today because uh, Dirks Bentley uh, personally bought me and my family tickets to come hang out with them backstage and you know check around the tour buses and everything. And that was amazing. Uh, I know that's the last place y'all expected me at, and it's funny because where they were performing was right up there where all these prisons at. You know, you got these correctional officers coming to my page and disliking my videos and all of that. 
And it's funny, I think I seen a few of them in the crowd, man, and they almost got the whole barn, man. They were looking at me all funny, but uh, <laughs> if they ready, they ready. Um, yeah, man, uh, I had a, a blast yesterday, man. Uh, go, uh, you know, going out there, it's a, always a blast, but don't get involved with the tailgating, folks. The tailgating, man, it's a whole nother, that's a whole nother show outside of the show. Good if those people know how to party, man, like, you a married man, you're doomed. <laughs> oh, man, um, but, uh, this, this, all jokes aside, this is serious business, man. Um, you, 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 you got to maintain your sense of humor throughout this kind of stuff, you know, because it's, 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 uh, it's depressing, you know, and you lose if you fall in, into that depression. Keep your chin up. Keep your chest out. Y'all know the rest. Till next time.